I'd like to talk about today uh, a very underreported story about a Al Qaeda connection in Boston to the 9-11 operation and to terrorist cells around the world. Uh, it surrounds uh, an Al Qaeda operative by the name of Nabil al Marab. Now, you probably have never heard this name before, but today I'm going to talk uh, in full about who Nabil al Marab really was. And to start, I'll start at the Chaldean training camp, 1989 90. Um, the Chaldean training camp is located in uh, the Pakia province in eastern Afghanistan. Um, the camp is regarded as the most well known. Um, and one of the oldest outside of al-Masada, which was the Arab camp created by Osama bin Laden. Um, this camp, the Chaldean training camp, uh, was headed by Ibn Sheikh al-Libi, uh, a Libyan national and a close associate to Abu Zubaydah, who's currently in Guantanamo Bay, held without charge. Found out that Abu Zubaydah really wasn't uh, that important with al-Qaeda. Um, now, Zubeda ran operations out of Pakistan, but he had no physical involvement with the camp, unlike al-Libi. Uh, the camp was ideologically at odds with al-Qaeda. Uh, most of the trainers were screened to refuse acceptance of fanatics um, for which Zubeda was in charge. Now, we have different camps located in Afghanistan, um, Afghan training camps which were uh, training camps just for Afghans. Uh, very few Arabs would attend. Uh, they didn't particularly like Arabs during the Soviet-Afghan War of 1979. However, the Arabs created a camp specifically for this purpose, um, and it was headed by Osama bin Laden called al-Masada, and that is where al-Qaeda was formed. Um, one of the camp's uh, notable trainees was Muhammad al-Zabi, um, El Zabi, a little bit about him, he was born in Lebanon um, and was given permanent resident status in the United States in 1986. Um, and while he was uh, training at Chaldean, he began with small arm training of guerrilla tactics. Uh, and he became so good, he took sniper training and then began training others on small arm tactics. Um, according to El Zabi, uh, and to FBI, FBI investigators. Um, it was here that he would meet uh, other uh, individuals such as Nabil Amaraba, Raid Hajazi, and Bassam Kanj. Um, El Zabi uh, would also claim to have met future notable terrorists such as Abu Musab al Zarqawi, who is the primary founder of the Islamic State in Levant, which later becomes, I mean, um, the Islamic State in Iraq, which becomes the Islamic State and the Levant, Abu Zubaydah and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Now, the, these accounts from al-Zabi are debatable uh, because as later on, under uh, interrogation from uh, prosecutors and, of course, to the CIA, Zubaydah claims to have never met with al-Zabi um, at all. So take what uh, El Zabi says with a grain of salt regarding Zubaydah. Um, nevertheless, by 1993, El Zabi travels to Chechnya and he would begin participating in the conflicts against the Soviets there. Um, meanwhile, um, he tries to enter Canada in 1994. Uh, using a fraudulent Saudi passport. However, his uh, request for asylum was denied by the uh, Canadian Foreign Office. Um, but that doesn't stop him. Um, he tries to enter the United States in 1995, but his application for asylum is also denied. Um, al Marab uh, also uh, visits the United States. He also applies for asylum. Um, both were denied. Um, so they would actually live inside the United States and Canada without an approved visa, uh, and they would stay in both countries illegally. Um, 
El Zabi, along with Al Barab, when they stood inside the United States, they were staying in Boston. And while he was here visiting the United States, he would meet with Hijazi. Uh, these were all the people that he met with um, while at the Chaldean training camp. And while they were here, they were both tried. I'm talking about Al Zabi and um, Al Marab. Um, they would, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Al Marab and Al Zabi would both uh, become employees for Boston Cab Company. Now, Hajazi, who lived in Boston for two years with Kanj, uh, who I mentioned uh, previously, uh, these were all, uh, the, this was the, the specific group training at Kaldin. Uh, this is also, this, is a, this isn't uh, a lie by Al-Zabi. This is actually uh, coming through later testimonies of people who knew these people while they were at Al-Kaldin as well. Um, so all these guys, Kanj, Al-Zabi, Marab, and Hijazi, all worked for the Boston Cab Company. Um, and according to a report from the Daily uh, the Boston Daily Globe, quote, Kant, who came to Boston in 1985 after fleeing his native Lebanon, worked as a cab as a taxi driver starting in the mid-1990s and helped secure Hajazi a job leasing and driving cabs for Boston Cab Company. Fellow drivers recall the two men as hardworking, well, with Kant being the more outgoing. There was never any problem, said Edward Tutanjin, president of Boston Cab Company, end quote. Now, al Manab and Hijazi were roommates for at least two months while they were living in Boston. Um, and both men would begin talking about furthering the jihad against the West, um, which uh, operations, which they would later claim, would be in response to the United States' further military actions against the Muslims in Somalia and Chechnya. Um, Hijazi is actually savings, uh, saving uh, his earnings while he was at work to spend on bomb plots. Um, and while he was doing that, he's working on an Al-Qaeda plot to attack a United States uh, naval warship. Um, by 1997, Al-Zabi had begun residency in Everett, a uh, town in Boston, and began working uh, as his three compatriots at the Boston Cab Company. And El Zabi um, had the good fortune to run into a neighbor from the town of Everett uh, named Mashur Masood, um, who was a cab driver for the same company. Um, Masood would tell investigators later that he met El Zabi and Al Marab while working as a driver out of Logan International Airport in 1997. Quote, I knew El Zabi was friends with Nabil Al Marab. Both were in Afghanistan fighting the Russians in the 1980s, end quote. Now, according to Masood, El Zabi would ask him where he, when he wasn't driving, if he could use his cab to make some extra cash, um, to which Masood uh, just agreed. He trusted him. Um, and El Zabi was quiet. Uh, he had a good nature about him, very trustworthy. So Masood didn't think twice about lending his cab to him. Um, for about six months, El Zabi drove Masood's cab during the day, um, handing it back to him at night because uh, Masood drove at night. Uh, they also lived together for about uh, approximately, I want to say five to six months, um, sharing an apartment above um, a place called Angelina's Submarine Sandwich Shop in uh, Everett um, until El Zabi left the area. Um, Meanwhile, Hijazi is accosted by the FBI, um, who are running an independent investigation on him. Um, it is suspected at this time that Hijazi is involved with the drug trafficking trade. Um, the FBI were investigating the heroin drug trafficking from Afghanistan to the Boston area, um, which didn't involve at first Hijazi, but because they knew he had visited Afghanistan previously, but were unaware of him being trained at Kaldin, had asked him if he would become a willing informant, and Hijazi agreed. Um, Hijazi also provided information about 
Arab terrorists and terrorist sympathizers, but the agents weren't even interested uh, in that because they were totally unprepared for uh, terrorism at this point. And they didn't have much in the way of a very good counterterrorism unit, unlike New York did. Uh, the FBI uh, would later be asked about the validity of Hejazi as an intelligence source, uh, to which they would question Hejazi's statements. Um, meanwhile, Al Marab would begin saving most of his earnings, as well as making several cash deposits, uh, such as wire transfers to overseas, in which some of the funding went to Hejazi, who is at this point in Yemen. Uh, according to U.S. Customs and to the CIA director at the time, George Tenet, some of the funding went to future 9-11 hijacker Satam al saskami who had a SunTrust account in Boston. Um, now, the primary source of al Marab's funding is not particularly exactly known, um, even to FBI investigators. But by 1998, al Zabi would travel to participate in Hajj in Saudi Arabia. Um, Meanwhile, he was asked by Abu Zubaydah to come and support the Chaldean camp, to which El Zabi refused. And instead, he travels to Chechnya and begin activities with the Ibn Khattab forces there against the Soviets in Chechnya. Now, of course, take that with a grain of salt, because according to, like I said before, Abu Zubaydah had never met El Zabi. Um, even though it is known that El Zabi was training at the Chaldean training camp. Now, this is, of course, this is very confusing. Um, it is reported that Abu Zabeda was in charge of the Chaldean training camp, but in Pakistan. Now, it comes out later, like I said before, uh, when El, uh, Abu Zabeda is actually interrogated by the FBI first and then later by the CIA, the CIA, even after they tortured a poor guy, bashing his head against a wall, putting him in a coffin with bugs, um, waterboarding, you have it. Comes out that he wasn't particularly um, the number three man in Al-Qaeda. He wasn't a recruiter and he wasn't important. What does that mean? I don't know. But like I said before, he's currently held without charge in Guantanamo Bay. He's also the only detainee held at Guantanamo, held without charge. So... When it comes to El Zabi and Abu Zabeda, really questionable. But there is no question El Zabi was at Chaldean training camp. But because Abu Zabeda wasn't there and he was running the training camp in Pakistan, that's what's, what's in question. Meanwhile, Jordanian officials um, would intercept a phone call between Abu Zabeda and a known Jordanian terrorist named Abu Hofar um, on, Org on, I'm sorry, November. 30th, 1999. Jordanian intelligence picked up a statement made by Zubeda as meaning an imminent attack is going to take place very soon. And Abu Zubeda is uh, actually heard to say, quote, the time for training is over. The grooms are ready for the big wedding, end quote. Um, on November 12th of 1999, I'm sorry, December 12th of 1999, Jordanian investigators, um, along with its military, began a nighttime raid on the safe houses used by Hofar. Um, and then particularly uh, using non-lethal methods, they raid all these houses and they arrest 15 people, including Hofar. Uh, they conducted an investigation and during interrogations, they learned that the plot was part of an al-Qaeda operation much bigger, that would include not just Jordan, but also the United States, India, as well as Syria and Lebanon. This would become known as the Millennium Bombing Plots Operation, and it involved multiple attacks, including the bombing of the Los Angeles International Airport, or its used acronym LAX, the hijacking of Indian Airlines Flight 814 to release no Pakistan terrorist and uh, Pakistan ISI operative Omar Saeed Sheikh, the bombing of the U.S. Sullivan's in the Port of Aden, attacks by the group Takfir al Hijaj in Syria and Lebanon, the bombing of the Radisson Hotel in Jordan, and suicide bombing on the border crossings in Israel. Huge operation. Uh, 
Jordanian officials would later link known terrorist operatives Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and Luai Sakara uh, and charge them in absentia for their part in 2002. At that time, uh, Zarqawi in 2002 is in Afghanistan and Luai Sakara, I believe, uh, was somewhere in Europe at this point. Um, it is not relatively known uh, because he moved around so much. Um, but I want to say that he was actually in Chechnya, um, probably somewhere in the Balkans at this point. He's a known terrorist. Um, I might do a separate interview regarding that guy too. Uh, but getting back to the story, um, the key plotters not only included Al Zarqawi and Sakra, but also Khalid Deek, a native of California, and one Raid Hijazi. That's right, our friend at the Boston Camp Code. Now, Hijazi would begin operations in Syria 2000, and even though he was in Syria, he uh, tried to uh, conduct uh, operations that were an extension of the Millennium Bonding Plot, but he was arrested by Syrian intelligence. Um, he is then relocated and imprisoned in Jordan because Jordan uh, actually really wanted him to elaborate on uh, Al-Zarqawi and Sakra. Um, now, Jordan is also known to be a very brutal state when it comes to their intelligence operations, the Makbar, um, and he begins to quickly cooperate with investigators. And he identifies himself as an Al-Qaeda operative and also identifies Nabil al-Marab as an Al-Qaeda operative still living in the U.S. Now, al-Marab, uh, meanwhile, he's now living in Tampa since the start of February of 1999. And just as he did in Boston, he begins driving a cab there. Um, incidentally enough, one of the participants involved in the Millennium Plot, uh, I cannot I would be remiss in not mentioning his name, Ahmed Rassam, um, who was apprehended by the by British uh, Columbia Customs for running away from his car when he found large amounts of C4 and bombing components hidden in the trunk and in the wheel of the car. Rassam uh, was arrested and while he was interrogated, had told that some of the funding for the operation had come from our friend Nabil Amara in previous months. Funding that came from Western Union wire transfers. Um, Massam's interview with Canadian authorities actually would later uh, uh, be illuminated to the FBI because the FBI now got involved with Rassam. Uh, and that, according to Rassam's testimony, there are numerous sleepers, Al Qaeda cells, inside the United States. This was actually something that was known to the FBI. Uh, way back in 1995, when the Philippines investigator Randolfo Mendoza had uh, uncovered a huge uh, operation called the Bajinka plot. Now, I did a video based upon that. You go look at that to, uh, to uh, further your inquiry about what that involved. But that uh, transcript of the interrogation of Abdul Hakim Murad, who was arrested, by Philippines, that transcript of that uh, interrogation of, of Abdul Hakim Murad went to the FBI, and within that transcript, Murad even states that they were sleeper cells as far back as '95 inside the United States that were uh, training at flight schools. So now you have 1995, 1999, 2000, FBI getting all this data about Arabs, sleeper cells, Al-Qaeda sleeper cells inside the United States. The Aden Abyan Islamic Army, which is located in Aden, Yemen, um, which is composed of former Yemen military officials and Islamic radicals, um, had long been participating in operations against the government since 1997. Um, 
but they didn't have a con. They, they weren't very constructed. They weren't well constructed. They were a loosely knit organization. That is until uh, Al Qaeda, at the request of Osama bin Laden, uh, began to join up with the Aden Albany Islamic Army um, with its founder, Zin al Abidin al Medar. In December of 98, to show the group were responsible for their terrorist activities, Al Maidan, along with the Islamic Army, um, Al Maidan with Al Qaeda in Yemen, and the, of course the Aden Albion Islamic Army, uh, kidnapped 16 Western tourists. And Yemen authorities conducted a secret, a secret operation to, to save the rest of the tourists who were being used in ransom operations. Um, this is where they would get their primary funding from um, until bin Laden started giving money of his own to help fund the, the group itself to become more formidable. Um, the operation actually was a little bit of a failure because during the operation in which uh, four detainees were killed because the payment was not received, in the dawn raid of the safe house, Yemen authorities actually managed to save 13 hostages uh, along with two members of the Islamic army who were killed in the operation, and al Midar was sentenced to death, along with three others, for their roles in the kidnapping. However, Yemen took notice of the group capabilities, which were now beginning to grow uh, under the fold of al-Qaeda. This is important because at this point, the NSA and CIA had begun monitoring the home of Ahmed al Hada in Sana'a, Yemen. Now, of course, I did a number of videos regarding this very important underreported story. Now, this is the antithesis of all terrorist operations, whether it be the uh, bombing of the USS Cole, whether it be the Millennium bombing plot, the 1998 East Africa bombings, the 9-11, um, September 11th uh, terrorist attacks in New York and Washington, because the NSA had begun tapping the satellite phone of bin Laden from 1992 to 98. And then they tapped the phone of this house in Sana Yemen from 1996 to 2002. The CIA had built a listening station off the coast of Madagascar to listen to uh, what was being said in the house, but they didn't have a tap on the phone. To learn more about this in full, go to my videos regarding the Ahmed al Hada. Uh, NSA uh, wiretap. Um, of course, the Yemen group, the Al the group headed on the Al Medi, were becoming to become more formidable. Um, so, where did they get this funding from? Um, this funding actually came from Bin Laden, and a small portion from Nabil Al Madab. It's important to note that Nabil al Marab generally is not known to everybody, um, even to seasoned uh, researchers, um, terrorist analysts, um, who don't know much about this uh, unknown individual, this mysterious man. But yet, here he is having his fingers in many pies. Um, now, according to the CIA and the NSA, as well as other uh, known independent journalists, um, the location in Sana Yemen, this, this Yemen hub, uh, was also visited by two um, well-known al-Qaeda operatives, Khalid al-Midar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. Now, Khalid al-Midar was actually married to Ahmed al-Hada's daughter, Hoda al-Hada, so that made him uh, the son-in-law. Um, Khalid al Midar and Nawaf al Hazmi were actually uh, participants in the Chechnya Soviet uh, war. They most likely served under Ibn Khattab, who actually is uh, known to Osama bin Laden. He's a uh, legendary figure in Chechnya. I also did uh, an article about him. Um, now, the FBI itself, I, I have to mention here, didn't have much in the way of intelligence regarding Yemen, but that doesn't mean that the FBI would begin their own uh, investigation. Um, 
now this is, of course, very underreported. The operation, which was an internal operation inside the United States, was called Catcher's Mitt, Operation Cap, uh, Catcher's Mitt, uh, in which the FBI had intercepted phone calls made by the suspects to which the FBI contends to maintain silence about how the operation started, even to this day, um, but included the, the monitoring of following numerous uh, cells, numerous terror cells inside the United States, uh, one being Im Imam Mandri, Shuyab Mosa Jokran, Adnan El Shukajuna in Florida, where they were plotting a series of attacks. Um, but Mandahi and Jokon were brought in for questioning by the FBI, and surveillance of them stops in late spring. You have to ask yourself why. Another Florida cell uh, that was connected to uh, the blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, in which the FBI had been investigating both uh, since 1993. Hamas operatives such as Mohammed Salah in Chicago, in which Salah insists. Money in the United States, uh, I'm sorry, in which Salah uh, actually invests money in the U.S. and sends it to the occupied territories to fund the tax um, in Israel. Um, Al-Qaeda operatives in Denver. Um, however, it's not known who is being monitored, though there are potential Al-Qaeda Denver connections, um, such as in 1994, a bin Laden front began routing communications through Denver and a passport was stolen there in 1995 from a man who was later confused as being one of the 9-11 hijackers. Um, Boston, and of course, last but not least, the Boston-based Al-Qaeda cell involving Nabil al-Marab and Raid Hijazi. Um, and this cell provided funding to terrorists, not just here, but also abroad, um, and who are also prominent document forgers. Uh, that's important. Um, the FBI long suspected that, that al Madab and Hajazi were al-Qaeda operatives and that they were sending large amounts of untraceable cash to areas like Yemen, Pakistan, and Jordan. A plot uh, was later beginning to take place now at the Port of Baden, a plot that was once previously hatched by al Madab and Hajazi back in 1995 in Boston. Remember I told you about Hajazi? wanting to create an operation about involving U.S. warships. Um, now these ideas would begin to take place within Yemen. And al Manab again, relocates, and he goes to Dearborn, Michigan. According to the testimony of an unnamed informant, later known as Ahmed Ashwas, at around this same time, al Manab is taking instructions from a mystery figure in Chicago known only as Al Mosul, which means boss or a person in charge in Arabic. Al Mosul asks Al Marab to attend the driving school to get a commercial truck's license, uh, to, a truck driver's license. Now, uh, also according to this informant, um, Al Marab and Raid Hajazi have plans to steal a fuel truck from a rest stop in New York or New Jersey and detonate it in a heavily traveled. Lincoln or Holland Tunnels in New York. Um, but the only thing that stopped this operation was um, Hijazi's arrest uh, in October of 2000 uh, while he's in um, uh, Syria. Uh, however, the story is actually later refuted by al Badab in 2002, but he would also refuse to say whether he knew Hijazi al Zabi as well. Now, of course, al Madab was going to uh, not implicate himself in a terrorist bombing plot of a, uh, of a United States target because that would actually be uh, not very wise of him to uh, probably get him about 25 years in jail. Um, now, Hijazi is actually still in Jordan uh, waiting uh, for his uh, sentence after giving investigators a cache of valuable information regarding numerous operatives living inside the United States. Um, and according to the Washington Post in the summer of 2000, quote, an FBI document circulated among law enforcement agencies 
after 9-11 noted that Hijazi, who is in a Jordanian jail, had shared a telephone number with a 9-11 hijacker, Hamza al-Gandhi. End quote. Boy, the circle gets a little bit tighter, doesn't it? Um, Hijazi's later tried and convicted in Jordan for his role in the, um, the planned uh, millennium bombing plots. And on October 12th of 2000, um, the USS Cole is actually bombed off the port of Aden. This would have been the USS Sullivan's, but the, the little boat, uh, which was carrying all the explosives, was carrying too much and it sank to the bottom of the sea. Um, here, they had just the right amount of C4. Um, and it was a martyrdom operation involving two operatives um, in which it killed 15 sailors, injuring 39. Um, intelligence would later show that numerous calls were made to Ahmed al Hadi Yemen Hub prior to the attacks, and commander of the USS Cole, Kirk Lippold, had been warned about possible attacks on the ship from no al-Qaeda cells inside Yemen, and of course from the, the Yemen uh, terrorist hub headed by al-Mahdi, um, but they decided to dock at the port to refuel. Um, later on, one name kept popping up, Abd al-Rahim al-Nashri, and he was arrested for his uh, involvement uh, with the uh, plot, uh, not just the USS Cole, but the, the Millennium bombing plot and the plot to bomb the USS Sullivan's. Um, But it was later found out that Nashiri, Nashiri, through his lawyers, that he may not have been involved with those plots. But according to the U.S. federal government, they later had uh, information that they found out through later intelligence that he was somehow linked to these plots. Um, Nashiri was actually captured by U.S. authorities in the United Arab Emirates in 2002. Um, Months later, in January of 2001, Bassam Kanj, who was a close associate of Al Marab, who was uh, an employee, a former employee of his at the Boston Cab Company, and who knew Al Marab from the Chaldean training camp, um, was killed in a rebellion against the Lebanese government in a five day battle which saw 21 operatives killed. Now, the FBI from the Boston office would hear of this news because Kanj was actually a resident, a longtime resident in Boston. Um, and so, upon hearing this, they had a renowned interest involving Kanj, Al Marab, and, and uh, Hijazi, as well as El, -Haz El, uh, El Hazdi. Um, Michael Rolinus, head of the FBI's counterterrorism operations, would later tell the Boston Globe, quote, the FBI has continued to look at Kanj and Hijazi's activities in the Boston area in hopes of learning more about their contacts inside uh, Bin Laden's Al-Qaeda organization, end quote. Now, the Boston FBI office begins an investigation, another independent investigation, this one much more vigorous than the first, into Nabil al-Marab, independently. Al-Marab had begun relocating back and forth from Toronto and Michigan in 2001. Al Madab had begun tentatively residing at 130 Jameson Avenue, an apartment complex in Toronto that was shared by Muhammad Atta and Marwan Al Shahi, who were involved, uh, allegedly involved with the hijackings of American Airlines Flight 11 and United Airlines Flight 175. According to an independent investigation from ABC I Unit Chicago, the apartment residents recognized Al Madab and Muhammad Atta previous to 9-11 attacks. And just a few short months later, al Madab would try and enter the United States, uh, this time hiding in the back of a tractor trailer from Toronto, using a forged Canadian passport and a bogus social insurance card. Um, and reports of his arrest would become known to the two major news outlets, including the New York Times and the Boston Globe, 
where they would report his detention in the following headline. Quote, American officials had plenty of reason to believe that he was up to no good. Nine months earlier, he had, he had been identified to American intelligence agents as one of Osama bin Laden's operatives in the United States. American customs agents knew about money he had transferred to an associate of Osama bin Laden in the Middle East, and the Boston police had issued an arrest warrant for his arrest after he violated probation for stabbing a friend with a knife, but the U.S. officials simply let him go, end quote. The United States immediately deports al Marab back to Canada, incredulously. Under his two-week detention there, al Marab would tell his detainees that he would remain in contact with the FBI and would tell them that it was because he was special. al Marab would also fail to show up for a Canadian deportation hearing in August and illegally enters back in the United States through Canada. According to Canadian authorities, they have begun looking deeper into al Marab, um, who most likely would have been imprisoned longer with his known close contacts with the future 9-11 hijackers uh, Atta and al Shahi. By August of 2001, Mohammed Kamal Azabi moves to Minneapolis, Minnesota, and his, no, and his name becomes known to the FBI there as well before the September 11th attacks. And according to law enforcement officials who declined to be interviewed, uh, he was also on a list of possible suspected terrorists. By September 2001, Canadian authorities were beginning conducting an investigation of their own into Ahmed Ab. And in early September, report by the Toronto Sun, quote, Canadian and U.S. police probing Nabil Ahmed Ab have learned he had a flurry of phone calls and financial transactions with Mohammed Atta and Marwan al Shehi days before the attacks, end quote. A resounding uh, bit of information, wouldn't you say? And yet the FBI continues to slip up and let this guy go. Why? In the months prior to the attacks, al Madab had begun wire transfers and deposits, which included 15 monetary transactions, uh, mostly sending the money transactions to the U.S. from Toronto. And they also intercepted phone calls days after the attacks. Well, al Madab praised the terrorist operation against New York and Washington. Meanwhile, FBI and Canadian authorities had enough information at their disposal to apprehend, finally, al -Banab. And in a 2002 FBI memo, what does it say? Quote, the FBI had been unable to rule out the possibility that al Madab has engaged in terrorist activity and will do so in the future if he is not removed from the United States, end quote. The FBI begins its largest investigation in history, which is called Pent Bomb, which in total detained a noble of three, 830 people, in which only four had likely ties to al-Qaeda. Zacharias Moussaoui, Ayub Ali Khan, Mohammed Azmaf, and Nabil al Madab. Moussaoui, who was already arrested, had, and being tried for his role as the, quote, 20th hijacker, Khan and Azmath, um, Ayub Ali Khan and Mohammed Azmath were detained in Texas and they were taken into custody while riding on an ammunition track train carrying $5,000 in cash. They had hair dye and box cutters um, and they were arrested. Now, my favorite 9 11 researcher, F independent filmmaker, uh, DJ Thermal Detonator, Nelson Martins, really is the only person that really goes into detail about who Ayub Ali Khan and Muhammad Asmath are. Go to his channel. I'll link it below to know more about that. That left our friend Nabil al as being the only person who was not arrested or detained by investigators. Finally, on September 3rd, 2002, Nabil al Marab is arrested by the FBI on charges of entering the country illegally. His sentence, eight months in prison. Um, now, federal prosecutors claim at this time that there's no evidence 
that Al Manab, even though there's enormous amounts of evidence that he was involved in any terrorist organization. What? Even though he admitted to investigators that he was getting weapons training in Afghan training camps, even though that he had money transfers through Western Union to Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, here in the United States, in Boston, in Florida, in Detroit. And before his deportation, uh, court proceedings regarding al Madab's case, headed by District Judge uh, Richard uh, J. Akara, uh, Akara had begun unabashedly stating that he was dismayed at how the prosecutors had simply ignored al Madab's connection to known al-Qaeda cells inside the United States. Quote from Judge Akara, quote, something about this case makes me feel uncomfortable. I just don't have a lot of information. He has a number of unanswered questions, such as how Madab had $22,000 in cash and $25,000 worth of amber jewels on his possession when he was arrested, despite holding only a sporadic series of low-paying jobs. These are the things that kind of bother me. It's kind of unusual, isn't it? End quote. Well, yeah, it's unusual. Nevertheless, al Madab continued to deny he's supporting terrorism or he's part of al-Qaeda, even though there's an enormous amount of uh, evidence that he was. Um, he is then... Uh, now, of course, the mystery surrounding al Madab continues to what U.S. investigators from Chicago, who opened up on their own investigation into, into him. Um, and that included the one anonymous informant who was jailed along al Madab while in Syria, who was known to Chicago federal investigators, in which al Madab would confide to this unnamed informant. Quote, he admitted he sent money to a former roommate, Raid Hajazi, who was later convicted of trying to blow up a hotel in Jordan, and that he aided Hajazi's flight from authorities, and that he planned to die as a martyr by stealing a gasoline truck, driving it into the Lincoln or Holland tunnels in New York, that he trained on rifles and rocket-propelled grenades at militant camps in Afghanistan, that he boasted about getting drunk with Atta and al Shahi, that he asked his uncle to hide an important data CD from Canadian police, that he acknowledged he distributed as much as $200,000 a month to training camps in Afghanistan in the early 1990s, and that he claimed he took instructions from a mysterious figure in Chicago known as al Masood. al Madab was deported back to Syria and was met with condemnation from even congressional elects that included Charles Grassley and Senator Patrick Leahy. And to this, mo to this moment, al Madab continues to live somewhere in Syria, unknown to most, and he continues to live on in total mystery, as he did while he was here inside the United States. Nobody knows much about him, and nobody cares to know about uh, apprehending him and bringing him back to the United States to answer for these number of charges. Or do they really want to? <laughs>